Thanks for coming to see this talk. I'm Sarah Groff Palermo. I'm talking about literary data on the web. Um, this might perhaps be one of the weirder discussions. Um, I'm gonna talk about making data art. I'm a designer first and foremost. I've learned to sort of write JavaScript and do all this stuff because I care about putting art on the web more than anything else, I think. And so I wanna talk to you guys about why to make literary data art. Um, you know, so we're gonna talk about, you know, since it's a JavaScript conference, I'm gonna tell you why you should do it with JavaScript and data and you should put it on the web. I'm not gonna talk about code at all because you are all very smart people who I know know how to look things up and figure out how to do things. So you don't need me to tell you about the code. I'm gonna tell you about different and interesting ways to think about art and why we should be doing that and what kinds of questions we can ask. Um, and at the end, I'll have a list of a couple of different resources and eventually I will put them up on the web too so you guys can go ahead and click through and have a place to start, but no code. And one last point, just a note before we start, is about using the word art. Art means a lot of different things to a lot of different people and you know, many bars have made tons of money providing drinks to people who wanna stand around and argue about what art means all day and I highly encourage you to do that with all of your friends because it's really fun. But today I'm just gonna go with the broadest interpretation and say that art is about experimenting and exploring things you like and calling it art and that's it. So anything you do that's that is art, I give you the official badge of artiness right now out of that. So why should we undertake it? Um, I have four excellent reasons. One is to understand ourselves. The second is to understand the systems to which we are subject and subject others. You could argue that's a subset of understanding ourselves. The third is to expand our horizons, datally speaking. And the fourth, and the most important again, is because it's fun. So all of these other things don't matter one little bit at all if it's not fun. And if you don't think it's fun, then you should totally go do other stuff that is fun because that's what we need most of all. But I hope you think this is fun. So let's talk about understanding ourselves. Um, this is where I say some very truthful cliches, right? We live in a time of accelerating technical change and as developers, we get to be at the heart of it. And that's an excellent privilege. But at the same time, the way we talk about data and code sometimes is really lopsided. Science and tech have their own biases, you know, including assumptions about objectivity and infallibility of data. And it's really hard to critique this within the, own, the system that says this. It sort of precludes it and closes over itself. But on the other hand, we have humanities, particularly history and literature, and they have as their project placing humans into context and then systematically criticizing the context in humans in pursuit of understanding. And in a lot of cases, so I do work with Bay Area Digital Humanities, you know, and we find that in the academy, a lot of humanities folks end up turning up their nose at tech, finding it to be this strange foreign land. But when humanitarians do that, they're also sort of giving up their mission, which is to push people in the context that they're at. So clearly, we need to make both of them fall in love. And when we do this, each side can help fulfill the other one's shortcomings. And when we do this, we understand ourselves as we are today and make decisions that are good for tomorrow. So that's understanding ourselves. But what about understanding systems? So recently, I went to the IO Festival, which is different from Google I.O., but it's basically a festival full of people who like to make data art. And I've gone for the last few years, and it turned out that this year something was different. And what was different was that people were feeling really defensive about data. People who loved using data to make artwork, all of a sudden, you know, there's Snowden and there's the NSA, and people with a lot of power using something we love for ends that we don't believe in. And there were a lot of talks about people either looking at the NSA itself or talking about what you can do, or even talking about small data, which is sort of what I talk about. Because, you know, in the end, when we do work with our own personal thoughts and ideas, in a way, it's sort of speaking truth to this power. And the same thing, right, with Facebook. We came back right after IO, and, you know, whatever one thinks about research ethics, there were a lot of people who felt very scared and manipulated by the kinds of work that we really love. And I mean, Sheryl Sandberg, she doesn't give a fuck, right? Like, they don't care, but we do. And when we do work together, again, when we pull together this code and this art and this data, then we have our own little tiny human-sized pocket of resistance by understanding the systems. And it's not gonna go back in the bag. So we can't just ignore it and say this isn't important. So we should do it on our terms. The third reason, which is 
much smaller after that sort of flight of fancy, is to talk about expanding our horizons, datally speaking. And that's to say we can push regular data visualization further by experimenting with it in cases where it's perhaps a little bit safer. Here is a terrible example of a chart of people experimenting with it, right? Somebody is like, hey, let's like make this murder rate chart look like dripping blood, which sounds like a great idea until it gives the exact opposite of the impression given that the deaths went down when in fact they went up fairly significantly. And that's a bad way to experiment with data. But this is a good way to experiment with data. This is um, a piece by Accurat about um, different, about art auction prices. And in this case, this work came from Georgia Lupi, who I saw talk recently. And you know, this comes from her playing with data in a safer place and finding things that are useful and have something good to say and being able to do it beautifully. And like I said before, because fun. We can, I'm gonna show you guys some examples after this, but the point is they should be fun and they should be funny and they should be interesting and that's the best reason of all. So, literary data. When I talk about literary data, I actually mean two things. On the one hand, there's artisanal data, which is basically using the same workings as literature with work that's not language. And then on the other hand, there's just work in which words and language are the data themselves. So we're gonna talk about both. Artisanal data is where my interest in all of this started. And when I talk about artisanal data, I mean data that's small, fragmented, incomplete. And this is interesting because it stands in contrast to a lot of the work we do with data viz, which is about pulling together as many tiny points as possible and then looking for a pattern inside it. And that can tell us a lot about humans as a whole, but where are we inside it? If anywhere, we are a tiny little demographic dot. But is that even us? I'm not average, I don't think you are. So we can do something different with data, and that's by starting with literature. And the way literature works is it gets us to identify with characters who have nothing to do with us and are utterly unlike us. But because books are these incomplete pieces that require our imagination and our empathy to bring them to life, suddenly those characters' lives are a little bit more inside us, and we understand that better. And that's the same work you're doing when you work with incomplete data sets and asking your audience to fill things in they start to imagine and feel them the same way. So the first example that I really like is First Chapters, which is by Stephanie Postsevec, um, and the work's been brought into D3 by uh, Jim Vlandingham. And the way it works is she visualizes novel openings as a series of completed sentences. The length of the line matches the length of the sentence, and they go around and around in a very pleasing layout until the end of the chapter is reached. Um, and this is the extraction of an experience. The formal expression of the novel is the expression on the page. Here's Hemingway. He's known for his brevity, but we can see that in fact, the sentences are long and the chapters are short, giving us that sort of light and airy Hemingway feel. Next, we have 1984, and look at it, cluttered up all on top of itself, just as claustrophobic as the dystopian system that it's telling you about. Finally, there's The Great Gatsby, right? This is an interesting interstitial. You can see sort of groups of sentences, and an excellent point here, too, is in the D3, which this is just a little cover, but you can see that there's some actual mistakes in there, and that by bringing it from just the handmade into the code, we're even adding another deeper level, which is wonderful. And each of these is an expression of what it's like to read that novel in and of itself and to experience its form. Another literary example is, this is a day in the life of a New York City taxi cab made by Chris Wong. And this is anecdotal data in the sense that he actually took a data set that told you about all the taxi cabs and brought out you know, a piece of each taxi driver going across. And we have the character of the taxi driver who's the most obvious and we start to put ourselves in his shoes. But even better, this has a second level. This has the level of the characters in the cab. That is, you can bring in and fill in things you might know about the city or somebody else brings in. All of a sudden you have another character that your imagination is making come to life. The next example here is quantified breakup. And um, in this case, this has much more traditional data viz, right? We have a bubble chart, we have line charts, but instead, it's about the author's divorce. And each chart, when pulled together, just as surely as words on a page, work to make a space for our imaginations to fill in and bring to life. Finally, this is the timeline of neglect, which is a piece I'm working on. It's definitely not complete. Um, but what it is, is it's a visualization of the books I own and do not read that sit on my shelf and sadly decay piece by piece, right? Um, but instead, I've taken JavaScript, this is D3, and made it you know, so that as every day goes on on the web page, these books will decay before our eyes until I start reading them. Um, 
And so in each example, data is not merely aggregated numbers in whose patterns we may seek to find ourselves, but the stuff by which we express the specifics of who we are. And right here is the mechanism where data becomes literary. And the transformation is wonderful because even more than opening up a new rich perspective through which to work, it opens up an opportunity inherent in literature, which is the tradition of using the way we deploy our tools to be a critique of those tools themselves. You know, you can ask these important questions. And Jonathan Culler, um, who's a really great literary theorist, he writes, you know, literature is a paradoxical institution and it lives by exposing and criticizing its own limits. <clears throat> by testing what will happen if one writes differently. And you know, when we look at the basis of what we do, and when we work with artisanal data in the realm of the aggregate, we express our truths and test our tools to discover what lies beneath. And when we see the stories we want to tell and the stories the tools try to make us tell, in their clash, eventually, we ourselves are revealed. So that's one way to do it. That is artisanal data. The next entirely different approach is to use language as the data itself. So in this method, there might not even be visualization at the end, it's using methods of data handling, but there will be play and fun. So sort of the theoretical basis of this briefly is in Task of the Translator, Walter Benjamin, who's um, a 20th century literary theorist, he talks about how impossible translation truly is because words in the context in which those words take their meaning are so tightly bound together that you cannot say that brought is pain. You cannot say that bread is the same to the German and to the French. It's not the same for all of the cultural context in which it sits. But if we look at the space in between those words and start emphasizing it, and we, if we do it without it being boring, we can use absurdity and abstraction and we can play and we can start to see these spaces and the meaning that we imply inside them. So one example is Patatap. And this is perhaps the most abstract example. It was actually made as an animation, as a sound animation kit is what they call it. Um, and what it is, it's a web page. You go in, you type in different words and they make different animations. And as you hit the space bar and change, you change the register in which the word is being typed. So each of those images is the same word, but we can see how it feels just a little bit different based on how we type it. What would happen if we typed entire novels into this and changed the registers of them? What does that say about translation? Um, another excellent example, less flashy, is the patent generator by Sam Levine. And in this case, he's used um, a Python library called Pattern to do natural language processing and turn works of literature into patent applications. <laughs> um, right, so in this case, uh, this is the front piece is looking at the communist titles for the Communist Manifesto. And what he's done for titles is append something like a system device apparatus, sometime web-based, in front of sentences that look like patent sentences, right? So the Communist Manifesto is also a device and system for appropriating intellectual products. Makes perfect sense. And it tells us a lot about what we do when we write patents. Uh, another thing that does the same work are bots. Bots are great. Uh, Tiny Subversions, this guy, um, he was talking about his bots at IO and it was really fun. So here's two bots, there's uh, two headlines, right? Which does a lot to expose just how structured headlines are when we think about the news, that you can basically take two of them together and swap out various pieces and it makes sense for a certain quantity of making sense. Uh, likewise, the game idea machine, will go ahead and give you some game ideas and you know it shows how you look at games um, and it's funny. Finally, there is a work that's using literature as data that's a little bit different and a little bit more serious but likewise super important and that is Matthew Connolly at Columbia is a historian and they've been using data techniques there to look for holes in government documents, to look at things that are redacted. And when you pull together all of the different holes and all of the different redactions, it tells you exactly where to start looking to find out what the government isn't telling you or to find out what you should be sending FOIA requests for even. That's a really big problem historians have. You know, What are you looking for if you don't know and it's hidden? And here they're using data to go ahead and figure out where to look. So these are all of the different ways that you can work with data and literature. Excuse me. <clears throat> and hopefully make really exciting stuff. So are you guys ready to start? Yes, you want to begin, you want to make something, but you're not quite sure where you should start. <clears throat> so one thing I like to do is think about the questions I can ask. What do you love that has nothing to do with tech, right? Because we're bringing in 
what we want to do is bring in something that's human and belongs deeply to us, but may seem somewhat foreign in the context that we're in. So if you can think of something, what can you make with that? What system has assumptions that you want to explore? When you go to do something, what is chafing? What doesn't feel right? Um, another way to start asking yourself questions is, are there just tools you want to play with? It's perfectly fine to start with the tool, right? Um, T3JS has a big gallery. Look at the layouts and say, I want to make something with this layout. What do I have that seems to fit? Um, there's also the pattern library. That's what that piece is at the top right. You know, do you want to do things with language? Make some plugins, put some things up. Or topo time, which is what this last figure is from. A friend of mine, Elijah Meeks, has been working on. And it's a way to create timelines with sort of fuzzy time. And when that can be interesting and important. Or just look at something beautiful and say, how can I remake that with data? These are uh, silver leaves you know, encased in wax. But is there a way to make a web-based version of this that because we are using computers and we're using algorithms to create what we're making, can we do this with data? And will it be this beautiful? Um, so once you know what you're going to do, you just have a quick little process. You probably write code, so you know a lot about the creative process already. I don't think any of you haven't, you know, sat in front of a big screen and been like, holy hell, what am I going to put on it? Which is, you know, the very important starting point of the process. But once you're finished flipping out, I'd like to start off with sketching. Whether it's sketching my own idea, I think sitting down with paper makes it really helpful. Um, the woman who did that piece with the triangles, Georgia Lupi, she likes to sketch, uh, just images of things that she's seen and enjoyed, and you know, slowly that works her way into her mind. So those are different ways to start with sketching. Then you should gather your data. Remember, this doesn't have to be perfect. The goal is for it to be imperfect. Um, then you want to test your data, and you will fail, I promise. Um, and then you should you know, test it again, do something different, mess around, change your sketches until you get something together that will work. And the fourth and most important point is to make it work and then show it to other people and see if it resonates. It doesn't have to be popular, right? Because it's art. Like, nobody has to like it. Maybe people won't get it now, and in 50 years it'll be great and genius. But the point is to show it to people and get feedback so that you can go and start your next project all over again. Um, so these are a couple of different things I recommend. Interactive data visualization by Scott Murray is sort of the O'Reilly intro book to data viz and to D3. D3 is great. There are certain parts of it that are a little bit finicky. I think you know, flipping through that book is certainly worthwhile. And then D3JS in action is the intermediate one. Lately, there have been some great posts, too, about performance by Irene Rose using Canvas with D3. Um, Shirley Wu wrote an introduction, and she's written about using D3 with Backbone. That can be sort of a sticky piece when you start using D3 to decide which component should really own the data and the rendering and how they work together. So there's a lot of great blog posts up. But in the end, you know, I just hope you want to do this. Ask questions, poke at stuff, make your computer do the hard work for you, express your incomplete truths, share it eventually. And if you keep doing that, no matter what kinds of bad things unethical people do with data, we can make our own sort of person size resistance. And together, we will do a lot of great work. So that's it. Thank you.